There we go. They are great. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm here to talk about service design, um, and I'm going to get straight into it because I know we're slightly behind schedule. We were ahead of schedule, but now we're behind. It's magic how these things happen. Um, okay, I'm going to start off by admitting something to you. I'm a 43-year-old man, and every month I have no idea how much money my household spends. I have no idea. Right? I have tried all of the services that you guys have been presenting so far this morning, and I love them all dearly, but I still have no idea how much I spend each month. So I want you all now to turn to the person sitting next to you, and I want you to admit to that person something you are ashamed of in relation to your money. Go on, turn to that person and admit that one thing. Right now. Go on. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, I just wanted to make a point. I was making a point. <laughs> I can make a point. Um, we all carry a degree of shame in relation to money. I certainly do, and I think it's a quite an important point that we all admit that money is quite hard. And we are all, in this room, very sharp, well-educated people. I count myself as pretty well-educated. Um, and... The thing I want to make another point on is that the average reading age in this country is nine years old. I know Monzo are doing a very good job getting to 11 years old in their terms and conditions. Most people in this country have, or four out of five people in this country, have sub-GCSE grade C maths. Um, by the way, nine years old, if you go into a Waterstones bookshop, that is not young adult. That is go even further, that's the kids' book section. If anybody here has a, a child, that is the kipper uh, book range if you read to your children and I've got an eight year old and she's reading uh, just about at that age now. So we have to work really hard to help people in this country to uh, understand money uh, and we have a world currently where there's a lot of food banks in this country. So we are all very smart people in this room uh, and we are designing services for, for people out in the world who are really struggling with money. And we have the power to do better, I think, and we need to do better than we are. Um, and we struggle behaviourally to manage money. I struggle behaviourally to manage money. Um, and I think people uh, need better money services, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So I am a service designer. I work for EY Seren. Um, I haven't always worked in financial services. I currently do. I've worked in multiple sectors, and I've, as a result of that, I've spent many hundreds of hours with human beings talking about services, and I'm very passionate about humans and services, and I'm very passionate about services as human systems. Uh, and I think services are, or the instinct to serve one another is a very ancient instinct. Uh, and I know we talk a lot about products, and I'm going to be a bit controversial today because I actually dislike the term product quite a lot and I think service is a really important word and I'm going to talk about it a lot and I might be a little bit controversial with a bit, bit of intent there um, uh, so we'll get into that in a moment. Please be a bit forgiving of me in that. Um, okay, so um, when I talked to Luke about this event a little while ago, which I'm very proud to be sponsoring today, um, he was talking to me about there's a bit of a two communities in this room. There is the fintech community, and I've heard a few of who've come from far and wide. People come from the US today, hold your hands up. Ah, amazing. Uh, anyone come even further than the US? Anyone come from other continents? And which continent have you come from? Congratulations, excellent. So, um, and there are a few people who come from, how I'd say, not necessarily fintech, but people who would like to be like fintech, like big banks. Any from big banks out there? <laughs> excellent. Okay, so a lot of our work, <laughs> sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean it like that, but you do want to be a bit like fintech. <laughs> but, but like, um, 
So a lot of our work is, is working with big client, big banks, right, who are looking at the fintechs going, oh my gosh, you know, we do need to be a bit like these guys, we need to learn from them. So, so I was saying to Luke, right, okay, so I need to kind of play to both camps, right, I want to talk to the fintechs, and I want to talk to the big banks who are like to be like the fintechs, or the big financial services, insurance, businesses, what, what have you. So I wanted to do two, two presentations. One is kind of like helping the bigger organisations to think about services. What is a service? Because you... A lot of financial services call themselves financial services, but they're not really financial services, and I'm going to talk about that. And then the people who are actually thinking that they're product businesses, they're talking about product design, I actually think you're designing services, and you know, Monzo and others, I actually think, when you say product design, I think you're actually designing really good services. So I just want to talk about service a lot. I'm going to talk about service a lot, right? Because um, I'm really passionate about that term. Okay, um, let's keep going. Right, okay, so thinking about services. Bit of theory here. Are you ready for a bit of theory? We've been talking a lot. I'm going quite large here. Um, we've been talking a lot about practices of design. I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I'm going to first of all talk about services and what they are. Because services make up 80% of our UK GDP. And you, we've got a few people from different continents. Everywhere you go, Broadly, if it's a Western economy, you will find that number is broadly the same. Uh, North America, South America, broadly the same. Uh, and other economies are going in that direction, right? We rely, everybody here, since the moment you woke up this morning, you have relied on services, okay? For everything. The moment you woke up, your heating, your utilities, your transport, you have relied on them. Yes, you've interacted with products, digital products, what have you, physical products, but they're all part of service economies and service organisations. Everybody here gets paid probably by a service provider of some sort. Um, yet we still live and think in a world of product, like these factory businesses. And I'm going to explain where this comes from. And I think, weirdly, the digital world of product has compounded slightly this 70-year-old manufacturing business logic that has been around for a long time. And I've been trying to articulate this, and anyone who sort of has bothered to listen to my rants on Twitter and LinkedIn a bit over the years has seen me going on about this. But these, these two worlds have kind of made life quite hard for us. And particularly if you work in a big financial services organisation and you try and do design in that world, you have been rubbing up against this issue for a long time. That you have an organisation that acts like a, a factory business and you're trying to do design like Monzo in it. This is part of the reason why your life is really hard. And I think it's worth understanding it because it will help you to do better design. Um, so I'm just going to kind of dig into it a little bit, okay? Because I think the core is services matter because products are vehicles for service provision, right? People want um, a product only in so far that it gives them an experience and an outcome. And you can see that from why Monzo is so effective because it goes right after the outcome and Finimize and everyone else, right? They are totally going after what is it that I want as a result of having money and having these things in my life? I want to progress in some way. I want to get to an outcome. Whereas so many of our larger financial service providers get lost in all of that and they think it's about something else because the scale has created... So they've just got lost in it a little bit. Um, and, and I think that's what we're trying to get back to, and so much of our work is trying to get back to that. But I think it's worth diving into a bit of the history here. And I've got one more quote, actually, here. Does anybody know Tom Goodwin? He uh, wrote Digital Darwinism. He's a, uh, I think he works for Zenith Media, a very big American firm uh, owned by, uh, not Mediacom, the other one. I can't remember, very large firm. Anyway, I quite like it because he's saying, everyone talks about disruption, which often means technology to people, but he says, um, uh, normally when we talk about disruptive companies, we actually just mean companies that serve people better, which I really like. They use better technology, they have better business models designed for the modern age, and they're built around modern consumer expectations. There's not anything really disruptive, right? And we, we, we know this because we see the firms that are doing really well. Uh, we've heard stories about them this morning, but you can see them at enormous scales in the Amazons and those sorts of things. Right, but it comes back to this, this one about they serve people better. And uh, what I wanted to do is kind of just deconstruct that a little bit, okay? So if I take the example of home ownership or 
Uh, and I look back to 70 years in the past over here, and this is how long I think people have been training managers in our big organisations for, uh, so, uh, how long this sort of e era of management training has been going on for, and how deeply embedded it's been. And you can look this up, right? There's an excellent book by a couple of authors called Vargo and Lush, which is a lovely couple of names. Vargo and Lush called Service Dominant Logic. It's a bit dense, but I highly recommend it. And they've really deconstructed this. Uh, and then I think in the middle, I'm going I'm to have a bit of a go at product dominant digital thinking. And I'm going to say where I think we need to go next, OK? So bear with me on a bit of theory here. Right, OK, so thinking about homes. The goal is to sell more mortgages. That's what, and I've seen this all the way through a lot of financial services organisations. I think what we've been doing in the last few years, and I've been part of this, the goal is a better mortgage journey. What I really think we all want to be doing is to create a better homeowner, right? That's what we, we all want to do, right? I want to create better homeowners. I don't just want a better mortgage journey. I want someone who's like, every day wakes up thinking, I'm a really great homeowner. I feel comfortable. I, it's all insured. I don't even have to worry about it. I'm just the best homeowner in the street, right? Better than everybody else. Right? This is not the goal. A, bit, a mortgage journey, like frictionless, do I care about that? Not really. You might care about it because you're selling me a better product with no friction in it. It's not enough though. <laughs> Next one. A mortgage is a product to be manufactured, right? Nice and seamless. But like that, that is the goal of the past, right? But again, lots of organisations, they're still in that world, right? Or an insurance product to be manufactured. Um, a mortgage journey is a product to be designed and built. Again, lots of labs coming together, designing and building really nice mortgage journeys. That's great. We're doing a lot of that. I'm certainly doing lots of that. We're making a lot of good trade in that world. But I want to get to here. A business is a service to be continually co-designed. Uh, the whole experience of uh, putting together multiple um, multidisciplinary teams together around creating a perfect great homeowner uh, to help people live in their homes comfortably. That's the goal, right? That's what we want to do. And that's what service designers are trying to do, if we're, if we're honest. And then I think I come across lots of this. Heads of distribution, like mortgages, are put on a truck and send around the country. And this is what we've got now, heads of products, right? I don't get that, really. Like, I don't know what the product is. I go to rooms and people will say, I'm the head of product, head of product. I'm not sure what the product is to the co consumer. It, does the consumer ever get a mortgage product? No. Do they ever get a... Is there any product for the customer in the home buying experience? Ever? No. They never get anything. Do they get a service? I, I think they do, but there is no head of service yet. So you get my point, right? I, I still think we have a real language problem, and the customer doesn't know where they stand in relation to product around a significant, probably the biggest expense in their entire life, owning a home. And so I think we need to reflect on that, and we need to understand what is it we're talking about when we say product. And that's not insignificant, given most people have this lifelong cost in their, in their lives. Okay, so I think I made a bit of a point there, and I'm not giving you all the answers because I only have 25 minutes. I thought about this quite a lot, but let's keep going. Uh, so how can you design for service? Okay, now I'm going to get a bit more practical. What I'm not going to do is go on about how service design is human-centered, collaborative, visual, iterative, empathetic. It's like every other design practice. We do all of these things that you guys will do. What I'm going to do is talk about a few things where I think we're doing something a little bit different. First one, okay, service design looks at the full, full human range of needs. I'm going to name check Live Work here. This is not something I've invented. I was lucky enough to work at Live Work, which was the design agency that invented service design. I ran the UK office for a couple of years. Um, now, Live Work invented this great model. It's four levels, okay, so we've heard a lot about user centered design today. Uh, and earlier on, we had a great uh, talk about really getting up to the human level at the top, okay? I recommend this model heartily because essentially what it enables you to do is getting beyond talking about user or customer level and, and looking at the full human, right? Because no one likes to be talked about as a user. Let's be honest. 
no one likes to be talked about as a customer because we're much broader than that. And that's why I made you do that exercise at the beginning. We are very broad in what we are. We all want to progress to being better off tomorrow than we are today. And um, we need to be considered across every single area. And when you talk to anybody in this room, they will have global aspirations for they want to go in their money. And then right down here, they might want to be using something day to day inside your app. But right up there, they might just want to be dreaming of the future. And your needs will map across all of those areas. And then therefore, how you design a service you'll get a great selection of opportunities across those four different tiers. And the service designers find it a really useful way of modeling your opportunities across those four different tiers. And uh, we find it's a useful canvas to work from. Second area, OK? Going from that is that we spend a lot of time, and our clients generally find us quite annoying for this, but certainly we, we spend a lot of time with them up in this top two tiers, OK? Because I think far too much design that I see is spent down here. Whereas there's no point spending any time down here, and I think the Finimize guys learnt this, right? <laughs> why, why should I hire your service? And this goes back to the product thing. You buy a product, you hire a service, okay? You can fire a service overnight, and I fired... There's no one from First Direct here, are there? I fired First Direct, and I went to Starling. I fired them overnight. You don't fire a product. You buy a product, you don't like it, you're lumbered with it, you keep it. You fire a service if you don't like it. And that's very important, right? I have to prove in my design process that I, I can get you to hire my value proposition. And there's an arrogance to just designing down here, yeah? Just designing at a customer level and a user level. Because the value proposition is up here. As a human and as a consumer, I have to recognize that you might well just go to your Uncle John in the pub on a Friday night and get your advice from him. Right? It may not be the, maybe the worst advice in the world, but you trust him more than you do your bank, probably, because he's the guy that you go to. So you have to compete with everybody in that person's ecosystem of trust, and you have to work that out. And the only way you're going to do that is by really going and spending two hours with him, drinking cups of tea and eating biscuits and doing really good ethnographic research to work out who do they trust? What matters to them in their lives? And that's what good design research does. And you only get to it by spending time at that human and consumer level of, of design. So again, it's important to spend time up there asking why. Why do these humans, where do they see value? And how can we design for that value before we get into how are they going to interact with this thing? Third one, okay, the raw material of service design is people. Okay, we don't have control over our medium because the medium is the people who control the service. Okay? What I mean by that is we work with the people who control the operations, the technology, the processes, the risk protocols. Because the service is huge. We work with big, large service providers, banks, insurance businesses, and they, um, so we're often given a huge range of people to work with. We have to influence them and help them to see all the things that I've just described and then work with them to help them change the business. So I often describe our work as we're out in the wild, right? We're out there working with all of these people in these different parts of the organisation. So you guys in fintech, almost in these smaller organisations, have it quite easy. These larger businesses, there are these enormous departments and silos that we have to work with. And we have to pull them along and say, right, do you see how these things connect? And help them see the system. Because... These individuals uh, have to kind of understand that and then work together in a very different way. So it's not something you can do with your headphones on. We don't, design is a very different animal in these large firms than it is, I guess, in a Monzo. Um, so uh, we kind of recruit for diplomacy and tact. 
And the bigger you go, and I'm sure some of the guys in the larger firms will recognize this, designing within a large business is done in the world. It's like a safari business. You're constantly out there uh, working with individuals, and you end up with that very T-shaped model um, of, uh, of, of individual. So it's, it's, it's something that um, requires a lot of tax, a lot of diplomacy. The fourth one is, we're pretty old-fashioned actually, so I love that Monzo is a bank that lives in your phone, but I also love the fact that uh, a lot of our clients have branch networks actually, because, and I love the fact that they have post rooms. Uh, we spent a lot of time, the reason I've got envelopes on here on the last project, is that we had spent a lot of time on a project last year weighing envelopes because there was a point in the journey for that target group that we were designing for where we wanted to create a moment of gravitas for that onboarding experience and it, uh, with the quote that we had was it want, they, the customer wanted it to feel like a wedding invitation. You know when that comes through the post and it, and it needs to feel like a symbolic moment so we weighed all these envelopes to get to that right point. The rest of the, a lot of the rest of the journey was um, a digital but there is a moment in time where these other channels are really important and we've had certain significant moments where branch conversations are really important too for certain customers where a unconstrained conversation Often, we describe it as tears and biscuits for some customers, post-bereavement, at significant moments where literally tears and biscuits in a branch with an advisor, uh, going right back to our earlier conversation, right at the start, is what people need to overcome some sort of awful experience. So we work across all channels to bring them to bear for our clients at the right point and try and reverse some of these weird things that go on these large organisations about, well, we can't use branches anymore because everything's digital. We're going to get rid of all of it. And we're like, no, you really mustn't get rid of it because the mixture of these channels is some of the value that you still have in your organisation. Nearly at the end now. Uh, fifth one, okay. Uh, service designers love engineering, okay. I love the Monzo slide with the corner of... Uh, uh, designers and the rest of everybody is like clearly engineering people. We love engineering. This is a blueprint. Anybody work with blueprints here before? Service blueprints? A few people? Uh, hey, 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 guys in the back. Go, yeah. Right, so this one is a blueprint. These are normally printed like 12 foot by 9 foot. And essentially, do I have like a laser pointer here? Is this a laser pointer? Yes, okay, look at me. Okay, power up. Okay, so here we have like target customer experience, two personas here. We did the whole thing of two personas. It's like a retirement journey, this. So it's the target experience going across here. Tiny font, obviously, it needs to be printed really large. So what we try and do is really simplify very complex things. So what we have is the customer story. So is it desirable? Will the customer adopt something? This is the end of a 12-week um, agile redesign. So every two weeks we tested it. So yes, it is desirable. The customer will adopt this experience. The business story, is it viable? Yes. We will make money out of it. We did a big uh, business case every not big. We did a business case every two weeks. Yes, we will the bank will make money because the customer will behave the way we expect them to. And the organizational story, is it feasible? Yes, because all these programs of work will be delivered and all the activity that we expect will deliver that outcome. So what this essentially does is it gives you those three things we all need. Desirability, viability, feasibility. But the key thing is, it's the first time in a large organisation where you have a single picture which enables one clear dialogue for the whole organisation. It's never, it never existed before. It's a visual asset for one organisation. So they become a wonderful tool that prior to that didn't exist. I'm going to keep going because I'm running out of time. Now, um, what we're beginning to call this is purpose-led design because um, I love the point that was made earlier about joining vision together collectively so you don't end up making the wrong dish. Um, so we have all these different things, human-centred, I described service-dominant, growth-focused, agile, loads of words, brilliant. Um, this one I just wanted to touch on though, this community-oriented. I described the four tiers, right? Remember those earlier on? There's one at the top that I haven't really focused on because it's quite new. But we're starting to look beyond that because we're not just humans. 
and individuals. In fact, isolation is one of the worst things and the most shameful, stigmatised things about money is that we're individuals and isolated. What we're starting to do is recognise the fact that we are members of something, a community, a family, a group of some sort. So I wanted to just end with one case study, which we're really proud of, which is work that we've done with uh, Bank of Ireland. And it is, Bank of Ireland came to us, we've been working with them for the last year or so, and we have, they recognised that they had a responsibility to the whole of Ireland to raise financial literacy across the board. So we helped them with a strategy which has now had them working w to introduce financial literacy and raise financial literacy across the whole of Ireland. So they've been working with schools across Ireland to do exactly that. And for me, that is exactly what purpose-led design should be. Not just creating things for users, for customers, for consumers, or even for humans, but getting into community-level design, where actually it gets right back to that first thing we discussed today that we were sharing with one another, which is the shame aspect of, I can't even read my bank statement. I don't even understand what money is in my life. And actually helping kids today to understand money, to understand numbers, to understand how it works. So that's what we're about at EY Seren. Come and see us later on. We are over in a stand where you can come and draw what money means to you. And we'd love to donate some money to the EY Foundation if you were to do so. So I look forward to seeing you later. Thank you.